Hello everyone. In this lecture, we're going to talk about linear regression. So let's remind ourselves about the supervised learning task and especially a regression task. The supervised learning is learning with experience. So my experience is a set of samples so I have a set of experience. I have M pieces of experience. For each piece of the experience, it's some input, Xm, and some output, the target. It's known during training. So for a regression problem, I would say Xm is a vector. Okay. So for the simple case, we only consider vector input. So it's a d-dimensional vector. So it's a vector. And for a regression problem, uh, the target is a real number. So this is my experience. I have a lot of experience. Then I would apply some machine learning system. And you will get a function. You will get a hypothesis. So previously I used M, but it can also be said as H, which is the hypothesis that maps from the input to the output space. Okay, so this is my machine learning model or oh, hypothesis. So this is my training phase. Then in the inference phase or in the prediction phase, I have some new data, which is oh, XM star. So I don't need the brackets because I don't I don't know the target during inference. So this is my test data. Then I would apply the function to each of the sample of this test data, okay? Each of the sample of the test, test data. So it's still x star m is also in RD, okay? So now I would like to apply the function and I make a prediction. So I call it t hat star m m equals one to begin. Okay, but this is my test set. So maybe, or maybe my own scene set. So, so the this number may be different from that number. Okay, so this is my prediction. So prediction is very important in machine learning. So usually after you train the model or you do the inference, you would like to evaluate your machine learning model. Is that good? If it's not good, can we adjust it, make it better? So actually you have the two labels, which is T star M. And this can be collected retrospectively. For example, in the stock market, you don't know the price for tomorrow, but after tomorrow, then you know it. Or maybe you already know it a priori, but you pretend that you don't know it and you ask the machine learning model to make a prediction. Then I take a look at my already known label and make a comparison. So based on this and this, it gives me some error, which is the measure of success of my machine learning model. When we design the machine learning system, we have a few um, components. So first, the hypothesis class. Hypothesis class is usually a subset of the functions that maps your input space to your output space. And also your training criteria. The training criteria or the training objective or the loss or cost is the criteria how you would like to choose a particular hypothesis in your hypothesis class as your selected machine learning model. So this is a function of hypothesis class. So you feed in a hypothesis class. You also feed in a data set. Okay, so set of all kinds of training sets. So this is the input of your, then it gives you a real number so you can pick, okay? 
So now for linear regression, we would like to solve these two problems. What is the hypothesis class? And what is the selection criteria? So hypothesis class for linear regression. So this is the this is the regression problem in general. So now we are going to talk about a linear regression where you know by its name it's linear. So let's say, assume, suppose a data sample is x, okay? It's bold x, which is x1, x2, up to xd is in my rd. Then a linear model, a linear regression model predict the output by a linear transformation plus a bias term and so you know it's linear regression of course we do some linear transformation so the target prediction target t hat sometimes i also call it y the t hat is so I can also denote it by y, also denoted as y. So maybe in the future I will use it as y. So t hat. So now you know, uh, in the convention for this term, uh, I call t as the true target. Okay, the true the nature of the data. T hat is something predicted, and then y is also the output of your model. So I call it y or t hat interchangeably here. So t hat is, you know, it's a linear combination. So the linear transformation is w1 x1 by w2 x2 plus xd wd xd. Okay, so this is the linear transformation plus the bias term, so plus the bias term. Okay, so all you can do is to predict the target by a linear combination of your input features plus the bias term, where W1 up to WD are my weights. Okay, I call W as weights, B, is the bias and w1 up to wd plus b are parameters okay so they are just terminologies so w are weights it's clear it's w so it's weights b is bias and both of them are parameters and there's not much difference here they're just terminologies okay so using linear algebra definitions, I can represent it in a more compact way, which is W, okay. So which is W transpose X plus B, okay. So I can make it bold. W is a vector and X is also a vector. And I mentioned X is here. So X is here. But what up? What about W? So you, you know, W is a vector W1, W2 up to WD, okay? It's also in R to the D, okay? So basically, uh, the W is a stack of these individual numbers, okay? It's a stack of these numbers. And I mentioned by default, a vector is always a column vector. So this is standard, even in math. So if you have a um, column vector, then transpose you means uh, you make column into rows and you make rows into columns. So when you have the W, you know, W transpose, now it becomes W1, W2 up to WD. So this is W transpose, okay? This is W transpose times X is X1 up to XD. 
and you can think of them as matrices. And now by the definition of matrix multiplication, then you know you get W1 X1 plus W2 X2 plus so on and so forth until you get WD XD. Okay, so this term is just this term. And then you have B term here and you just copy B term. This shows that such vector matrix representation is correct. And this is also known as the inner product. Right. People like to use angle bracket to represent inner product. So this is also represented like this. So W and X are vectors plus B. So this is just a notational issue. Okay, they have the same meaning if they are real vectors, okay? So this is one of my hypotheses. If I have different W and different Bs, then I have different hypotheses. And all the hypotheses you can have by changing W and B is my hypothesis class, okay? So the hypothesis class for linear regression is all the hypotheses you can have by changing the W and B. So the hypothesis class for linear regression is all the functions H of X, okay, is W transpose X plus B. So this W and this X are both, so they are both, such that W is in RD, and B is in R, in R, okay? So I can also parameterize H by W and B, okay? So this shows all the hypotheses that you can choose is no more than just a linear transformation of X plus B, okay? So example. If D is one, so I only have one dimensional input. So the input X is X is R and target is also in R. Okay. So in this case, so I can say Y is also in R, I mean, Y is the prediction of your target or maybe called T hat. Okay. So for example, if you scale it by scale something by pound, okay, this is pound, so x is pound, and you want to predict the weight by kilograms, okay? So now you know one pound is, you know, 45, one pound is 0 0.45 kilograms, and maybe two pounds, you know, is 0 0.9 kilograms, okay? So this is the true knowledge that we have, okay? This is the true knowledge that we have. But in reality, you know, when you weigh something, there's some noise. So maybe you get a few data samples like this, okay? And what is my hypothesis, you know? The hypothesis is not the true line, I mean. The hypothesis is not the true line. The hypothesis may be, um, you know, the hypothesis may be um, any function, any linear function, okay? This is one of my linear function. Or maybe this is another of my linear function, right? And I allow you to shift it by B, so it may not cross the origin, okay? The hypothesis may not cross the origin, for example, okay? So all of them, follow the format of W transpose X plus B. Okay, in this case, it's W X plus B. So in this case, okay, this is Y, sorry. So in this case, Y is W times X plus B, okay? And all the functions that I ha can have by W plus B is all the lines in this two-dimensional space, except the vertical lines, right? So vertical lines, anywhere are impossible. So vertical lines are not possible. Okay. 
So this is my hypothesis class. So the hypothesis class for this case, for the one dimensional case, is all the lines, is all the lines except vertical line. So for a vertical line, if you have X, you have multiple Y associated with that, okay? That's not even a function, so it's invalid. So a valid hypothesis is any line that is a function of X, okay? So given X, you have a particular Y. It may be good, it may be wrong, but that is in your hypothesis class. And you have all kinds of lines there. How about two-dimensional space? So if X is two-dimensional, so now it becomes a vector, so I call it bold X. And T is still in my R, so my prediction or my Y is also in R. Okay. So how about that? So now you can think of any my input as X1 and X2. Okay. And this is my Y. Okay. So maybe my X is also my um X is the size of my animal, and X2 is the fur of my animal. It's a real number. And X and Y, or the target, or the Y is the weight, maybe kilograms of my animal, okay? So I'm still going to use the linear regression model, okay? So in this case, Y would be some W1, X1, plus W2, X2 plus B, where W1, W2, and B are my parameters. So now I show it here. So I have two-dimensional space, X1 and X2, okay? This is the two-dimensional space as input. And the target or the output is the third dimension here. It's going to this space. So this highlighter is the only thing that I can find that stands. So this is my third dimension. So what is the hypothesis? A hypothesis is a linear transformation plus a bias term. So a hypothesis should be any plane. Okay, it can be this, this, or this, or that. So it can be any plane except the vertical planes. So any vertical plane like this, it doesn't make sense. Or this, or this, or this. Any vertical planes, it doesn't make sense. Because the plane has to be a function of x. So given x1 and x2, you must have one prediction. And if you have a vertical plane, or uh, then you know you have multiple values associated with that, so it it's not valid. So for any plane that is not vertical, then it's fine. Okay. So this is the three D space. Okay. We have two input space and one output space. Okay. Let's continue. So what if my input is three dimensional space? So my input is three dimensional space. Okay. So my input is one x two x three. My y is a fourth dimension, right? So maybe someone says, okay, maybe time is the fourth dimension in the space time. So maybe I can say this is my time, you know. So I have a time space. So this is my Y and then this is my X. So there's some curve in this. So this is a bad way of visualizing a high dimensional space. And this is really complicated because you know, you have to slice this line into many subspaces but each of the subspaces is infinitely large. So this is a bad way of visualizing. So what I suggest is this. So if you are dealing with a high dimensional space, maybe uh, four dimensions, but maybe even higher, maybe 400 dimensional space, you just plot a maybe low dimensional space, okay? This is X and this is Y, and you stare at X. Okay, you say this is a hundred dimensional space, then it becomes a hundred dimensional space, and y becomes the next dimension. Okay, so now you still have a li linear regression model, then you still have a line, then you know, in, in this axis, it contains a hundred dimensions. Or maybe you can make it a little bit more concrete, and you draw a two-dimensional space, okay, so this space is actually the x space, and you stare at it, and you say this is a hundred dimension, then it becomes a hundred dimensional space. Okay, so you see why. 
So this is the correct way of visualizing high dimensional space. You just draw a low dimensional space and you say, okay, it's high dimensional. Then it becomes high dimensional. So now we're clear about the hypothesis class. So a quick note, a uh, quick note. So linear transformation versus a fine transformation. So by linear transformation, I would say y is maybe w transpose x, or maybe y is x transpose w. So this is linear transformation. So linear transformation doesn't allow you to shift around, okay? So this is linear transformation. But a fine transformation says, I allow you to add a bias term. I allow you to move around. So this is a fine transformation. So why the bias term is needed? The bias term may be some, you know, residual effect or some, uh, you know, base effect. So for example, if you have X and you have Y, this is the prediction, which is the target. Maybe X, uh, you scale it by pound. Okay, the same problem. So the Y is scaled by kilogram, maybe net weight in kilogram. Okay, in kilogram. So maybe you have some package and the package takes maybe 0.1 kilogram. So this is the package. So now the relationship between the Y and the X becomes here, right? So it no longer crosses the origin, but it becomes here. So having this bias term, this term allows the model become a little bit more powerful. to be a little bit more powerful. So if you allow to learn a bias term and your data happens to be linear, which means the bias term should be zero, the model can still learn that, okay? So it just makes the model a little bit more powerful. And sometimes a fine transformation can be reduced to a linear transformation in a higher dimensional space can be reduced to okay, linear transformation, but with a one more dimension. So for example, I would say, let's call, so let's call X tilde as, maybe I just have a trivial feature I define, define a very trivial feature X zero as one, okay? So let's say this x tilde is x, is x zero and also x, the x is your previous, your original feature, okay? So now this is a block matrix. So this is in fact, x zero, x one up to xd. Okay, so in this case, the vector becomes d plus one dimensional, okay? So likewise, I can define W tilde as I put B here, B is a scalar, and then I put W as a vector here, which is B W1 up to WD. It's also in R to the D plus one dimension. Now the pr prediction Y is, previous prediction is W transpose X plus D. Now I can represent it as W tilde transpose X tilde, right? I absorb B into W and I extend X by a trivial feature, which is zero, sorry, which is one. So in this case, they are the same. Now I can get rid of the translation of the bias term by um, extending it to a higher dimensional space, okay? So this is a comment. So in linear transformation, we're actually doing a fine transformation for input features. But the question is why linear? Why we only have linear? Why we don't have quadratic or maybe sinusoidal or whatever features or exponential, right? Or linear or fine, why? So why do we define a fine functions as my hypothesis? So the first reason is, okay, we must state our preference. And we learned that in our previous lecture. If we don't define any function, then the model cannot learn. 
But if you define something, okay, if you define sinusoidal, then I can ask why sinusoidal. If I define exponential, then why exponential? So you have to say something. So this is our one reason. And another reason is, you know, many physical processes are indeed linear. For example, if you travel some distance, then it's the velocity times t. So now if you have a lot of distance and time pairs, you can estimate the velocity, okay? But whether the model is in linear or not is not the main reason why we fit a linear model, okay? But notice that whether it's linear or not, whether it's the physical process, whether the physical relationship is linear or not, um, is not the main reason that we choose regression for the linear hypothesis class. So this is different from statistics. So statistics says, I know this is my physical process and I know the parametric form of the physical process and I want to estimate the parameters. But this is usually not the machine learning case or not the artificial intelligence in general. Usually artificial intelligence are solving very difficult problems where you cannot model the true relationship between different variables. It's really complicated. And as I mentioned, you know, if you have the one and you map it to one, it's really complicated. You cannot design a, a you know, analytic form and say, this is my true relationship. What you need to do is just to estimate the parameters, okay? But we still prefer linear models or some simple models for many reasons, right? And the major reason is here, we set our preference. But linear models usually doesn't give you very good performance, especially in the deep learning era. Everything is nonlinear and everything is very deep. So if you just apply a linear regression model, usually it doesn't perform as well as the deep neural network. But we still prefer to study linear regression at this moment for many reasons. First, it's simple. Okay. So of course, linear functions are probably the simplest function that we can analyze. It has many theoretical results, some theoretical results. You know, sometimes we can only analyze theoretical results on simple models if it's too complicated, then I don't have a theory for that, right? So it's very important to understand the principle of machine learning models uh, with a simple example before moving on to complicated ones. Another reason is nonlinear models can usually be transformed to linear models in a certain way. So nonlinear models are usually can usually be transformed to linear models in a certain way. Okay. So as long as I know the linear model and I know how to transform it to a nonlinear space or how can I transform a nonlinear space into a linear space, then I can do nonlinear problems. So there are a few ways. The first approach is by nonlinear features, okay? I can just define my feature. Suppose originally your feature is x, and if you have a linear function, then at most you can have a fine function, and most you have y is w x plus b, right? But I can add nonlinear features. For example, I say, how about this? This is w1, okay, plus w2 x squared, plus w3 x cubic. So and so forth, okay, I only have this. So now this time I can say the model is still linear, but it's not linear in the feature x itself, but it's linear in x, x squared and x cubic. Okay, so it's a cubic function, but it's linear in this space. Okay, it's not linear in x itself. So this is one approach that you solve nonlinear problems with linear models. The other model is nonlinear kernels, okay? And the main idea is 
So we will cover nonlinear kernels in this course, but uh, maybe at the end of this course. But nonlinear kernels is about the high level idea is saying, I can define some inner product of data samples of two data samples as I like according to some criteria, but uh, in general, this is your choice. You can define the inner product. You can think of it as uh, some similarity, okay, measure, okay? I just want to measure whether two samples are similar or not. Then it turns out that such inner product could be the inner product of features in the high dimensional space, okay? And now you do linear models in that high dimensional space, then you are doing non-linear models in the low dimensional space or in the original input space. And the third approach is non-linear uh, transformation, uh, learnable. Okay, so for example, I can have uh, wx plus d, so it's a linear function, but I can add some function, some non-linear function, like some squashing function or some uh, nonlinear activation function like this, and now it becomes nonlinear. Okay, so I still have the linear transformation, but I apply some nonlinear activation functions, then it becomes nonlinear. Then I can do it again, so I can say this is W2 plus B2 with some other function, okay, so this F1. So what is good about this approach is you can learn these weights according to the task. So these weights are learnable. So you can learn how to transform each of the function and you can learn all the functions end to end, okay? So that's why the third approach is probably the most powerful approach. And this is known as the neural networks. Okay, and after you have this, and if you want to make a prediction, you still have linear models, okay? You just have one more layer, or if you have classification, then you have a linear classification model, so it's still linear. So I hope this explains why we would study linear regression for a long time. We will discuss most of the machine learning principles with the example of linear regression. And later we go to linear classification and uh, we should be very familiar with the principles. Okay, training criteria. So the general intuition of our training is to fit my training data as best as possible, okay? So to fit, so to fit the training target as much as possible, but only, but you can only work with the linear model or an affine model. So by the way, this is known as extended feature or augmented feature. So X is known as extended features or augmented features, but it's not really a standard terminology. And in research papers, you see more often that people say the bias term is omitted. So I just omit by a term. Uh, when appropriate, the bias term can always be added. From now on, I may omit a bias term as I like. So theoretically, I should use the tilde notation, but it's too ugly. So sometimes I just omit the tilde notation. Okay. So this shows that for a data sample, I, for data sample, maybe I would say, the data sample xm and tm, okay, notice that x is a vector, t is a scalar, which is my target. So my prediction with a linear regression model, h whose parameter is w and b, my prediction y, so I can also call it t hat, but now I decide to call it y is so y is h who is parameterized by w and b of xm, right? 
this is my data samples prediction. So by my linear model, by my affine transformation, then it's the same as saying W transpose X M plus B, right? So now my general goal is to fit the training target as much as possible. So it's intuitive. It's intuitive to penalize how YM is different from TN, okay? So now I can define my J. So this is my training objective, or this is my training loss or cost, okay? But I'm just defining the loss for one data sample. So now I'm saying this is the loss from Ym minus Tm, okay? They are both scalars, right? So I can take the absolute value. So it's non-active. Okay. So this is one of the loss that I can choose. So it turns out that it's more standard to have a square loss, okay? So I penalize the square of the difference, okay? So this is known as the square loss a square error, but I would like to use loss for training. Okay. And for aesthetic purpose, I can have one half here, okay? So this one half has no effect in the optimization because you are optimizing a quantity. Then if you multiply it by constant, then it doesn't affect which is the optimum, right? It has no effect when you do the optimization. And the main purpose is when you take the derivative, this two cancels out this half and it makes things look a little bit better, but it really has no effect. So if you don't have that half, it's just fine. But I just include it for aesthetic purpose. Okay, so square error loss is uh, more typical than the uh, absolute difference. So with my training set, x, m, t, m, where m is one up to m. So notice that m is x is still a vector. So the total loss, or the overall loss, okay. Okay, I call it overall loss, is, okay. So for each data sample, I have a loss then the total loss is the average over per sample loss. So I'm just summing over all the data samples. So what is your difference from your target? And I just sum them together and then it gives me the total loss or it gives me the overall loss. And, uh, but I normalize it by the number of samples, okay? So pictorially, so let's say, suppose this is my regression model. So W plus B, okay? So this is X, this is uh, Y. So suppose D is one, okay? And suppose these are my data samples. Okay? So they are, these are data samples. So they are not too different from the line. So what is the loss? So the loss, I would like to zoom in a little bit. The loss is your prediction. So this is my, I would like to use a plus to represent my data samples because cross looks like X, okay? So I call it X1, I call it X2, and I call it X3, X4, okay? So what is your target? So this is target one. Oh, sorry. So we use superscript to represent number of samples. Target is at T1, right? T2, T3. Okay, I'd like to zoom in even larger. And T4, is that right? Yes. So what is your prediction? 
So your prediction is this. Okay, so this is my, this level is my H1. Okay, or maybe I call it Y1. Y is, the, is my prediction, I, or you can also call it TH1. Okay, so this is your prediction, right? This is my hypothesis, you see? I can make my hypothesis red. So this is my hypothesis, okay? HWB. So this is my prediction for the first sample. Where's my prediction for the second sample? So this is the, my second sample. So the prediction is here, right? And where's my prediction for the third sample? My third sample is here. My first sample is here. My third sample, this is my prediction for the third sample. And this is my prediction for the third, fourth sample, okay? So this level is uh, Y2, and this level is Y3, and this level is Y4. So the loss is the difference between your Y and your T. So this is either Y or T because it's not divided by, but it's either Y or T because they are in the same space, uh, but they are just different quantities. One is the target, one is the predicted target. Okay, then the square loss uh, square error says uh, you have the difference, you compute the difference and you compute the square. So I would, I would first compute the difference. The difference is this, okay? For the first data sample, right? So the difference is this, so it's here. And for the second sample, the difference is this, right? So this is your prediction up to your uh, data sample. And the third difference is this. Right? This is your prediction, and this is your sample. And likewise, the fourth difference is this. So this loss is the mean, is the average, you see, is the half of average of the sum, okay, sorry, average of the bar, the, this distance, the distance square, okay? So you first compute square and then you compute the average. Is that clear? So you first compute how, what is the difference between the predicted value and the true value and you raise it to the power of two. Then you compute the average of all the square difference. Then it gives you the total loss. So this is, the, this is also known as the mean square error because I'm optimizing the mean of the square error. Okay, mean square error, sometimes called MAC. Okay, just a comment. So on Y, we have mean. Why we don't have the summation of all the square errors? First again, it doesn't matter, right? Because my optimization variable is my parameters. Okay, so my optimization variable is my parameters. So J is a function of WB. Of course, J depends on my training data, but this is a constant in terms of your optimization. So when you do optimization, you are minimizing, minimize, minimize J with respect to W and B. So you can tune W and you can tune B, but you cannot tune your training set. So the training set is given, then it doesn't matter, right? So it's just a constant when you do the optimization. And if you multiply the objective with a constant, it doesn't matter. But still, average, averaging may be more numerically stable for your training algorithm, algorithm with different data samples. Okay, so maybe I would like to design my training algorithm and there are some, uh, it's some numerical optimization algorithm and it has some parameters and I have two of my parameters. Now maybe I would apply the algorithm with these parameters to some other task. And with that task, we have different number of samples. Then if you don't take it average, then maybe if you have more samples, then you know the loss become much larger, and sometimes that would affect your optimization algorithm. 
Okay. So this is my preferred way of optimization. When I optimize the loss, I usually optimize the average loss over the samples. I usually don't optimize the total loss over the samples. That is less numerical stable, but it doesn't make too much difference. Okay, it doesn't matter too much. But what matters more is y square. Why we use square? Okay. So it's intuitive that uh, we have the difference, absolute difference, because you know. Oh, by the way, it's not even necessary to have the difference, absolute difference, because the square, then it doesn't matter whether it's absolute value of the negative or that. So it doesn't matter. So why do we need the square? Okay, so a few reasons. First, it has very nice uh, theoretical justifications. which we will leave it later. We will first solve the problem and then interpret it in some probability fashion. So we will just leave it later. Second, intuitively, square loss penalize more, penalizes more on bad predictions. Okay. So for example, if you have absolute loss, if you have one sample with a loss of two, and two samples have a loss of one, they are the same. But square law says, okay, I would focus more on bad predictions. If you have one loss of two, then the square loss is four. If you have two losses of one, then the total loss is just one, right? So square loss penalizes more on bad predictions. So this is just the intuition for square loss, but the first point shows it has some theoretical justifications and we'll cover the probability interpretation later in the course. And also uh, it empirically works well. In many senses, for example, it gives you good performance. And also it's, it's easier to optimize, right? Because square loss is smooth. If you have the absolute loss, it's not smooth. The point here is not differentiable, so it's easier to optimize. So for many reasons, but now we just take it heuristically. Okay. Okay, so um, let's summarize what we have learned today once again. But in another representation is matrix vector representation. So in the previous representations, we only talk about one sample at a time, but we can group different samples together and make it a matrix vector notation. And that is sometimes more convenient than a sample wise notation. So prediction, so I will say that Xn Tn Okay, still be my training set, be my training set. Okay. So originally, what you predict is Ym is W transpose X plus B. So these are both where W and X, they are both are r to the d and b is r, okay? So this is a prediction for one symbol. But we can define, we can stack all the samples together, okay? We can define all my samples together, so I use it a capital X, or it's a matrix, so I sometimes use a bold letter to represent a matrix, but I can also use a non-bold letter, so it doesn't matter. I stack all the samples together, okay? But now this time I put the sample as a row, so I say, this is my first data sample. Okay. This is my first data sample. And this is my second data sample. So and so forth up to my M data sample. Okay. So, um, So I mentioned for any vector, it's a column vector. So if I want to make it a row, then I take the transpose, okay? So equivalently, this is saying 
oh, you know, the first row is my x1. So x1, first sample for the first dimension. And x1, 2, the second, second dimension up to x1, m to the x1, d to the d dimension. Okay. I can represent it as a extended feature. W tilde and X tilde, and I just omit tilde, so I just get rid of B. So likewise, here, I would like to extend it by X zero one, which is all ones, okay? So this is one. So just remind you, this is one, okay? And this is my second sample up to my mth sample. So this gives me a matrix. And what is the dimension of that matrix? So the dimension of a matrix, you know, is something by something. So the first number is the number of rows. You count in the column dimension and it gives you the number of rows. And the second number is you count in the count the columns in the row direction. So you enumerate in this direction and then you count the number of columns. So this gives me n times d plus one. Okay. So with this definition in mind, so this is known as the uh, design matrix. With this definition in mind, I can say why now it becomes a vector. So I can directly compute the output for a bunch of samples, which is x times w, okay? Is that correct? Yes. So one way to verify your vector representation is correct or not is to think of its dimensions. So the y, I'm, I'm trying to compute the output of different samples at a time. So how many samples do I have for y? I have m samples. So y should be a vector of m, right? Dimension of m, m dimensional vector. So a vector is a column vector. So you can think of it as a m by one matrix. So what is the dimension of x? x I mentioned is m times d plus one. Then what is the dimension of w? So I mentioned W is a vector, and whenever we have a vector, it's a column vector. So when a column vector, then it's D plus one times one. So when you do matrix multiplication, you know, this stuff cancels. So eventually you get N plus one, N times one. Okay, so this shows your dimension matrix. And it's always suggested that in your implementation suggestion, in your coding, always comment on your variable dimensions, okay? If you have very intensive matrix vector multiplications, then always make a comment on what is your vector dimension, and that helps you debugging a lot. But this is not a proof of your matrix representation. If you show the dimension is correct, it's only a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. To actually prove that, you need to prove it by the definition of matrix multiplication. So, you know, you need to multiply it by W0, which is D. Okay, so W0, I define it as B, W1 up to WD. Then the definition of matrix multiplication is you take row in the first matrix and you take column in the second matrix and you multiply them element by element. That's why this number must match that number to make the matrix multiplication valid. And you just take the multiplication element by element and then you sum them together and give you the result. But this is precisely the definition of Y here, whereas here, okay? So this is the precisely the definition of Y here. So it's valid. So it's correct. So you have multiple rows in the first matrix. And then when you do it, you get Y1 
y2 up to yn, and you still make it a vector, then it's correct. So this is the y, it's a vector, which is m dimensional vector. Okay, so this is the matrix representation. And the loss, okay, is obviously the mean square error. The mean square error, okay, I call it J. I can represent it by W minus Y, so minus T. This is my output, and the T is my target, okay? T is also a vector, so T is also a vector. So this time the T is both. T is also a vector, which is T for the first sample up to T to the nth sample, and then it's in the odd M dimensional space, okay? When you compute this factor subtraction, you simultaneously compute the difference of all different samples. And then you take the L2 norm of the samples, okay? So L2 norm square. So for D-dimensional vector, the L2 norm is in fact V1 square plus V2 square up to V D square, and you take the square root. But this square root cancels with this square, so you have the, you know, the square of everything, right? And I can take the average as you like. And more generally, for LP norm, for LP norm, it's defined as V1, so this is a vector, P plus V2P plus up to the dp and you take the p root so it's to a power of one over p okay okay so this is good to know but we will not use it at this moment for future lecture plans we're going to understand the mean square error loss a little bit more basically we will show it it's convex okay convex it just means curving up and then we will show nice properties of the convex functions. Um, if you have something convex, then it's very good. Property, it's nice function, so you have a lot of properties for that. And then it's usually easier to optimize. And we'll talk about some optimization. And how can I find W and B to optimize this function? Okay, see you in the next video.